very special guest, Ward Cabot, is presenting all night tonight. Uh, so actually, uh, Adam uh, Kelsey is actually going to be presenting, and then uh, we also have another gentleman from Ward Cabot. Ben and myself. Ben Shell? Ben Shell is also actually a developer at Ward Cabot. Uh, so these gentlemen are going to be here tonight. Uh, Adam's going to be presenting for us. Feel free to ask questions unless Adam tells you not to. Uh, so they're here to talk about deployment and a few other things, scaling. So this is actually a very cool topic. I know a lot of you have actually asked for this for some time. So we're very honored to have Work Habit be the ones that actually are presenting that one this year. So let's give Adam a great round of applause. <laughs> Excellent. So, as he said, I'm Adam Kelsey. Um, I run product development for uh, Work Habit, and uh, we're becoming fairly well known and experts in experts in scaling Drupal and doing Drupal for, for large sites and, uh, and uh, everything from the scaling of it and making it work for, for massive amounts of traffic to actually doing the production of lots of developers, multiple staging servers, development environments, kind of merging everything together and bringing everything in. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, in addition to the scaling stuff. So how many people in here have actually built a Drupal site before? How about a non-Drupal site? All right. <laughs> Excellent. How many of those sites have, have grown to be more than one server? So you, you got you know, it grows large enough that you need more than one server or you start kind of outgrowing your current hosting and you've got to figure out a way to, to make that bigger. How many of you would like to have that problem? <laughs> or eight. So, we're talking about scaling Drupal. We're talking about cloud computing. Has anyone heard cloud computing before? I was amazed at all of it. So, what's scaling? Scaling has nothing to do with how fast a site runs. It is, this, this line here, this freeway, you can drive, this highway, drive as fast as you want on it. But there's too many cars there, so you're kind of constrained. There's only a certain amount of throughput that can go through that, ends up slowing you down. But it's really about how much capacity that can hold. So this is more scale. We go out, we go wide, we can carry more. Now, of course, they can go faster. The same number of cars can go much faster because you've got more room to work with. So, scaling Drupal, there's a few things you can do. Um, one, there's, I'm going to talk about it in several stages. One is what you can do inside of Drupal itself without making changes to your server if you don't have access to do that, without making changes to uh, Drupal itself and making changes inside the Drupal core and modifying that. In general, modifying Drupal core, not recommended. Stick with what you download and don't make changes to the piece you download change outside of that. Uh, it breaks upgrades, new security patch comes out, and now you can't upgrade because you've made changes to the inter internals of it. So you want to avoid that as much as you can. Uh, there's also uh, module bloat. So we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk about caching uh, a little bit in, the, in, uh, in a minute, but I want to go talk about what you can do inside of Drupal to help make your Drupal site perform better and handle more customers, more people at the same time. One of them is modules. Every module you install increases the amount of memory that Drupal needs to run, and that decreases the number of visitors a single web server can handle at a time. So limiting those is good. There's a lot of modules that are being designed now to not increase the memory footprint unless it's actually being used. So right now, if you enable 30 modules and you go to a page on your site that doesn't use any of those modules, it's all still loaded. And all of that stuff is still loaded in memory and still sits there. So some developers are, are starting to, to work toward, on their individual modules, solving that. But in general, enabling modules you're not using is going to slow your site down. A big performance killer is the statistics module. I know it gives you all kinds of nifty information about how many people visited this node and that sort of stuff. But one of the problems with the statistics module is on a, on a heavy site that's got a, a lot of traffic, it's constantly, every request is writing to the database, and it's constantly hitting the database. Um, you may not see it on a smaller site. If, if, you're, not, uh, if you're running on a, a single server, you're running there, you're not hitting the, the performance of, uh, limits of your server. 
But if you're banging up against the performance of limits of your server, disabling the statistics module can do a lot to immediately give you a little bit of breathing room and work with. So that's that's a specific one, and it's just because it is so it's it's quadruple and it is so database intensive. Every single request of page writes several values to the database, and so you're constantly writing to the database. It makes it harder to scale out and scale your database out, which is something that we'll talk about in a little bit about techniques for, for making your database handle more traffic as well. Index optimization. So in a perfect world, every developer that creates a module would really, really think a lot about what database queries they're making and what indexes can be used to make those database queries faster. But it doesn't happen. Most developers, myself included, Write a module, oh yeah, I need this, this index, I need that index, and I'm going to go through and build this. I finish writing the module, I add some more features, and I forget to go back and add that. So keeping an eye on what types of queries are being done on your server. So MySQL's got this thing called the slow query log that you can take a look at and you can see what queries are taking a long time to run. You see a lot of those happening this over and over again inside MySQL. You can identify this query is a problem, find the module that that's in, and go through and add indexes on, on how to do that. What an index is, it, it's basically a lookup table for the database. So it tells the database, how do I get to this data faster without having to seek through the entire disk? Let's store the location of the data. That way the, the database is able to more quickly find the data so it can retrieve it and send it back to you. Um, indexes are gonna take more disk space on your server, so you're trading disk space for speed. Disk space is a whole lot cheaper than new servers. So it's a trade-off that I recommend making all day long. And then the other one is MySQL engine selection. So uh, in MySQL, you've got several different ways you can store the data. There's the MyISOM, there's NODB, there's a lot of different storage engines. Most hosts, most servers are set up by default that MyISOM and, and uh, NODB are both there. And MyISOM is usually the, the default uh, database type. You just create a database and don't say what type of table you want, what, what, where, how you want that database created, creates the MyISOM table type. <clears throat> Those are great because it's very compatible, it it's, does all kinds of things, it's got all kinds of great features. Um, it is dog slow. The, the problem with it is anytime you have to write something into that database, MySQL has to lock that whole table and say no one else can touch this. You can't read from it, you can't write from it, you can't do anything to this whole database table until I'm done with that. Now it's done, it unlists that lock and other people can do it. So if you've got a lot of traffic on the site, a lot of people are writing, say you've got a lot of people signing up and registering, and they're constantly adding entries into the user table. They're constantly changing their user profile. That user table keeps getting locked. And that kind of sucks, because now nobody else can log, the logins take a little bit longer. Now that lock is quick. It happens very, very fast. It locks it, inserts it, done, you're, you're going. But you start adding that up and multiplying it out, those start to stack up, and it causes some problems. NODB is a database engine that was designed for, for much more like enterprise apps, for larger company apps. It's designed like a real database management application is. It's more like Oracle, more like those, those large, expensive database apps. It locks at the row level. Hey, I'm going to write to here. I'm only going to lock that record. I'm not going to lock everything at once. So if, if you can have a lot more concurrency there. I would suggest for most sites, converting every table on your site over to NODB, except for perhaps the search tables. The, search, the, the, the tables that hold the search indexes, you're not writing to those a lot. It's all read heavy. My ISIM is probably going to be a better choice for that. There's a lot of science that goes into picking what table type you're going to do for, for different things on, in MySQL. You're pretty much going to be good if you go with NODB for everything except the search index and go with MyISOM for everything else. Any questions so far? Am I, am I somewhere? Is this making sense to people? Or Okay, good. I have one question. Um, the, um uh, the statistics, uh, I have like an Google Analytics installed uh -huh. on the module. Right. Does it also slow down everything? Or? No, it, it might slow down the front end of your site a little bit because it's got to load this JavaScript, the, the user has to load the JavaScript. But Google, Google Analytics isn't writing to your database. Oh, okay. And so you're, you're fine there. 
Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, does Google Analytics also slow down your site, like the statistics module would? Is that going to also contribute to that? So how would you recommend the statistics and which one I'd use a third party. I'd use statistics outside of, of uh, the database server. So I would either Google Analytics, uh, a copy of, there's a great app written by a guy named Sean Inman called Mint, haveamint.com. Great little, I think it costs 35 bucks and it's got all kinds of stats that you can get, all sorts of plugins. Run that, but on a different database server, so you're not tying up your, your DB server um, with, with that. Uh, something like you know, Hitwise or, or some of the third party analytics tools. They're gonna give you a lot better statistics than, than uh, the Drupal stats module does anyway. The Drupal stats module says, this piece of content was seen this many times. It's not terribly useful. So since when? Well, that was seen 4,000 times. Great, it's six months old. Is those 4,000 times mostly right now? Is it mostly six months ago? Is this suddenly getting a lot of traffic? Who knows, it's just a simple counter. It's like the, the website counters that you see, the little odometers you see on somebody's webpage. This has had 4,000 hits. How, how useful is that information in general? Okay, I can see that that was more popular than, than something else, but it's also older, so it doesn't tell me a whole lot. Something like Google Analytics or Hipwise or Mint or, or any of these other apps will also tell you, this is what's popular right now. This is where your traffic is coming from. This is where, these are the search terms people are using to find your site. These are the browsers people are using. And they'll tell you all of those more, more detailed statistics than just, here's how many times it was loaded. If you use different engines for different tables, does that interfere at all with joins and cross queries and all the complicated things like that? Not at all. No difference? No, although you're generally going to be slow, as slow as the slowest table. So if you're having to lock something in one table on the join, every, the, the, the whole query is being held up for that lock, especially if it's got to wait for a lock to occur. Um, but you're never joining into the search table, so using a different table type for that is, is fine. So when people are actually coding uh, a module that has a custom table or something like that, uh -huh. uh, they definitely would probably want to check out the different types of engine selection that they can put because they can fold it into their SQL statement on the installs of their module, correct? Right, so your install file on your module can actually specify what type of table it creates. One issue with doing that is, although NODB is very, very common, it's not everywhere. So if you're, if you're trying to get the po po widest possible base and you're worried about PHP 4 compatibility and that kind of thing, and you're thinking about those issues and trying, hey, if the, the every $5 a month shared host needs to be able to run this, then NODB might be an issue there. If you don't specify anything, it falls back to the server default, which mostly usually is, is my ISOM. Um, so this is something from an admin standpoint, you go and install a new module, you might need to go through and, and do a table conversion. If you're using a MySQL admin tool, it's very, very easy to do, you just change the table type. PHP My Admin, it's a drop down, you select your table type, you hit go, it makes the conversion. The more data that's in that, the longer that conversion is going to take, and, and it will bog your site down while it's doing it. So don't go, gee, my site's under a lot of load, I need to convert to, to NODB, and it's under load right now, I'm gonna make this change, because that's gonna hurt you more than it's gonna help. Wait until you know, some off-peak times to make the change. So will switching to a different table type eat my data? There's always a possibility anytime you're doing a mass transformation on any data, on any table, that you're going to have data loss, so back up first. Um, you know, store backup before you run the, the convert uh, command. Test your backup too before you run And it. yes, try and import into someone else. Because there's nothing worse than having lots and lots of backups and suddenly needing it and discovering that none of your backups are good anymore. That, that's generally a bad thing. So with any system, anytime you're backing up anything, test your backups regularly. If, if you're doing some mass, potentially destructive operation, Test your most recent backup and make sure that it's actually good and, and has all the data you want and really is a most recent backup and you, you don't just have like goofy naming on it and you named it today's backup but it's really three months ago because that, be, uh, that would be an unfortunate problem. <laughs>